and then we share my screen. So today we're going to look at research methodologies. Okay. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so today we look at research methodologies. Last week, we looked at types of research, where we looked at two overarching generic researchers and the, the, those that fall under them. Um, I believe they were basic research and in, empirical research. So we want to, this what I'm teaching, what I'm giving you, should I say those are the building blocks for research, the basic components in research those things that guide us into what to do. So today we are going to look at um, research philosophy. Now, when we look at that word philosophy, this morning we had a, a long discussion with the, with the class about what the word philosophy means. Um, can I just ask uh, Jovia to quickly type in the word philosophy, just philosophy. What does the word philosophy mean? Philosophy refers to the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence, especially when considered when considered as an academic discipline. Okay. So what the, the definition Javi has given us is when it is considered as a discipline like medicine or IT or something. Eh? So my question to you is does does that definition make any sense to anyone? When you hear it, the fundamental study, let me just pull it out also from my, I have my smartphone here, I can also do that. So that this, the, the study of the, the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge. Does, do those words mean anything to anyone? Yes, my dad. Yes, what, what do you think of when you hear? I think of studying or going deep into a certain study. Going into a certain study. Going deep into details. Deep into details. Okay, yes. that's, a, that's one. Eh? That's one way of putting it. That is true. Eh? Now, let me also give you something one of the fathers of philosophy, Socrates. Eh? I don't know if any of you have heard of Socrates. He was uh, one of the first known philosophers in the history of humankind. Eh? He was Greek. Most, so most uh, first, uh, first philosophers ever known were Greek. So there was Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all those were Greeks. So Socrates asked a question. Let me give you an example of a philosopher, what they would think about. Socrates asked a question. How do I know that I exist? Let me ask, for example, let me ask Vincent Sevunya. How do you know that you exist? <laughs> it's a funny um, question, I, I, I know, but it, it's an important one. Eh? Because uh, Socrates are saying, what if, what, if, what if I don't actually exist? What if I'm not here? I think I'm here, but I'm not here. I think what, what I do really determines what, what do you I do? exist or I don't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> I think I, but that's a good answer, Vincent. There, there was, I watched a movie, I forget the title, where there was uh, Nicole Kidman, it was acted by Nicole Kidman. She had two children and she, it starts with her saying that, that there are people who are coming into her home and uh, and she, she kept the, the curtains of her house closed because she was saying her children had a certain disease. 
they couldn't be exposed to the light and so on and so forth. And then she 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 said that the people who were in her house, they were trying to get her daughter to possess her and you know, things like that. And the whole movie, as you're watching it, you're thinking maybe there are ghosts in her house. She closes curtains, somebody comes and, and opens them. Then at a certain point, two people come to work for her. And then as the movie goes on, we realize that actually it was Nicole Kidman and her children and the servants that were dead. And that the, the people who are in the house were actually the people of the reality now, they moved into the house. They, during the day, they tried to open the curtains, this one closes. You know, and you actually find she's the one who is the, the ghost, not these people. So that question, uh, Vincent uh, say, answered a good question, I answered it well. And this is how Socrates said, how do, you, how do I know I exist? And he said, because I think. He said, I think, therefore I am, yeah? So that, that mere act of the doing, that mere act of thinking proves that we exist. Now that's a philosopher who is studying the nature of things, their existence, okay? And uh, so th that is typically a philosopher. Now, if you look at the second on Google, if you look at the second definition, it says a theory or attitude that acts as a guiding principle for behavior, okay? So each one of us has something that guides us in what we do, there's a philosophy that guides us in one way or another, yeah? How we behave towards our friends, how we behave towards our family. Generally, what principles guide each one of us? Eh? I, I remember one time, I know most of you are from Masaka, so you resonate with this. I have a friend, a very good friend of mine who is a Muganda. And uh, one time we had a conversation where he had a girlfriend. So I was asking, he broke, I had a girlfriend, I knew he had a girlfriend. And then he, I asked him, he, 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 he later on I was trying to find out how the girl was and he tells me, no, we broke up. And I said, hey, what happened? Then he said, no, you know, um, it, it turns out she was the same clan as my grandmother. And then he said, even at first I thought I could ignore it, but she said, my father called me and he was really unhappy about it. The fact that she was of the same clan. And I know most of you being Baganda, this resonates with you very well. Eh? For myself, I'm Mtoro, although I'm not very sure about what the rules are there. But I remember he told me, then he said, what his answer after the end, when how he came to his decision, he said, when my father called me, he said, yes, I could have gone on. He said, but when my father called me and I could tell he was disturbed, I asked myself the question, who is my father to me? And that was that was what made him make his decision to break up with the girl. Not that the girl did anything wrong, not that even that she was so bothered about the clan issue, but because his father was bothered. So what, what did that speak about? It, took, it spoke about his philosophy of obedience and submission to the father, yeah? That speaks about his personal philosophy as a person, as a human being. And each one of us has a philosophy that guides us. Now, at the same time, we, now here we are talking about philosophy in research. How does this guide us? So um, we are going to look at generally two major philosophical views. The first is the positivist and the second is the interpretivist, yeah? The realist is normally a combination of the two, positivist and interpretivist. Now, last week we looked at types of research and we saw different types, but as we discuss this, you will realize that these two, positivist and interpretivist, they point to qualitative research and quantitative research. Do we all remember those two types of research? Do we remember them? Hello? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I, I hope you do, I hope you do, because as I speak, I'm going to assume you remember these two types of research, okay? So we are also going to look at the two approaches, deductive and inductive. They also very much follow these two types, interpretivist and, in, and positivist. 
Uh, in the next week, we shall look at research strategies, which are also related to the two philosophies. The research strategy you select will depend quite a bit on the, on the approach, the philosophy that you, choose, you tend to pick. Uh, next, the following week, we shall look at validity and reliability. Yeah, then look at ethical issues of research. Now, in general, when we look at when we're looking at the research process, we're actually looking at a layer of, of things that we we have to determine when we are doing our research. Last week we looked at the word phenomena. So I'm assuming this word is already familiar to you. But essentially in, in the in the simplest format, what I can say, the phenomena would be that particular issue you want to study about. That particular issue you wish to observe, study, and then report back about. So we would have our, our phenomena or our, our phenomena. Then we have our research philosophy, which may be either positivism or interpretivism, one of the two. After that, this, up, this philosophy would, would then guide us to what approach we would need, which then guides us to the method, the strategy or method. This layer that you see here, which has experiments, survey, case study, those are research methods or strategies. The time horizon also um, would, would, then, would then determine if are we doing cross-sectional or long, longitudinal. Then finally, at the very center, we have what we refer to as our data collection tools. Many times I see in students' research where they misrepresent what these are, yeah? These are our research tools. They are not research methods. They are data collection tools. Your research methods would be any of these. And we shall also discuss those methods which are particular to IT. So let us first look at the first philosophy, positivism. Now, there is a feeling among people who are, um, who follow this philosophy that this is the objective way of carrying out analysis. And to a certain to a yes to an extent, that is true, because a positivist researcher strictly looks at what is quantifiably observable. Yeah, what we can quantify, what is observable, what we can quantify and, and observe, where we represent our data in a statistical analysis. So I may give you an example. Uh, let us say I go to several schools in Uganda, I count the number of boys and the number of girls. And then I find that there are more boys in school than girls. And then, then I say, therefore, the male population in Uganda may be more educated than male children, than female children. That is possible. If I was to go and count the number of PhDs and their gender in Uganda, this past week we've been getting a lot of um, a, a lot of news about new PhD holders. We have we've had the first female uh, PhD, uh, first PhD holder of in law, the first female, the first woman to get a PhD in law in Uganda. So that is something good to celebrate about. So imagine we were we were to do um, a survey on on all PhDs in Uganda and then quantify them against male and female. And then we find that men are more than women. And then someone make a, make a conclusion that men are, are more highly educated in Uganda than women. And even go ahead, even maybe to have statistics of masters and so on and so forth. That is, uh, should, be, should they would, a positivist would say, this is an objective analysis because you're looking at numbers, yeah? You're looking at numbers and the numbers, one, one would say numbers don't lie. In this, normally they argue that positivist researchers are independent and neither they neither affect nor are affected by the subject of research, which is true because uh, quantitative research, the researcher is very far away from the respondents, okay? Very, very far away. Normally you give out questionnaires, you. If it's physical, physical that uh, I, I come and let I'm the researcher and you're a respondent, I come to sit, I come sit with you, fill out the question, I take it away. Those are a few minutes of interaction between us. 
So I would say I haven't gotten your opinion on anything. I've not gotten your feeling about anything. So we would say that I'm, you're being, I'm being as objective as possible. Yeah. So this is the idea. And, and one of the things about positivist research they, that is that there's a law like general, generalization. So I gave you the example of if I did a survey on PhDs and masters, and we found that men, there are more citizens that are men that have PhDs and masters than women. Therefore, we can say men are more educated, have higher levels of education than women. We can make that generalization. That's the thing about um, uh, positivists. Now, the very opposite. Remember last week when we were looking at the, the, the different types of research, each was versus the other. So it's also the same thing with the philosophies because all these other types, all the research types stem from these two philosophies. Interpretivism says, looks at life in another format, okay? If you, those who remember what qualitative research means, it, was, it, was, it is saying that the world is complex. And not only is it complex, it's also, there are also everything that is in the world is unique. The feelings of Jovia about this class are not the same feelings as Henry's or Conrad or anyone else, eh? or Tony. You each have different feelings and thoughts about this module. If I was to ask at the end of this lecture, if someone was to come and sit down with each one of you to pick out what you picked, it would be quite different. The circumstances and the individual uh, thoughts and processes are quite different. Maybe I have come to, the, even me, the lecturer, maybe I've come to this class today when I'm hungry, I didn't eat lunch, or I've received some upsetting news, or any of you. What you will perceive of this lecture will be very different from another person, who maybe uh, their only concern is the Wi-Fi, where they are seated, or maybe they're not, they're seated in a place where they are not comfortable. So what does what the interpretivist view is? They are saying that the world is complex, but it's also unique. The, each situation is unique, each circumstance is unique. So therefore, I cannot come in with a generalized view. So for example, if they were to study the phenomena of, the level of, of education levels of men and women, the interpretivist would say, I want to sit down with, an, with female academics. Maybe we'll have a focus group discussion to find out about their experiences as academics, you know, so on and so forth. Then do the same for the men. You may find the past, the, interpret, the interpretivist is not just giving you numbers, but they're giving you feelings of, let's say, a female professor, uh, the circumstances under which this woman works the hurdles she goes through to get what she has gotten, yeah? Um, so imagine maybe she tells you, I'm a mother, I'm a wife. As a mother, I'm then responsible for the child if the child falls sick. As a wife, I'm responsible for my husband, his comfort at home and so on and so forth. This would be very different from a male professor who may be a father, but their only concern is providing the financial perspective. So you'd find that the interpretive researcher wants to get a holistic picture, hmm? needs to get the details of, 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 of the situation. Now, not, most of the time, there are arguments from the positivist side that the interpretive side that is not objective. And it, of course, it can tend to be difficult when you are when you interact with, especially because interpretivism requires you to spend time or the qualitative research, it requires you to understand and that means spend time. So when you do that, of course, your emotions get involved. One of the key things about any researcher is objectivity, to try and, and, and distance your feelings from what your, your, your respondents are feeling, but to report back genuinely about what the other person feels, whether you believe it or not. 
like myself, I, 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 I was giving the example in the first in the morning class. How, when I was doing my research in India, in India is a, a, it's a parish within um, Ngozi sub county. So in India, when I was doing my research, I spent some time with the community, which community was made up predominantly of what we call PhDs, a village health team. These are ordinary community members that provide basic health care to people in the village. So I remember when I had a bias when I went in. Um, that time when I was doing my research, that particular community was engaged in a project with University of Notre Dame in the US. And I remember one of the first workshops we had when we went to, when I was participating, what the first things the VHTs said as soon as they saw the donors were, oh, we need bicycles, we need bicycles so that we can move around, visit our, our people and so on and so forth. And then there was another lady with me and she said, now look at these people. Yeah, because they've seen a white person, now they're asking for money. So of course, immediately she said it also mean my biases came out, but immediately I had to caution myself that, you know what? This is the reality of this community. If they are living in poverty, that is their reality. It's also the same reality that's going to affect them to be able to use a mobile phone application. If they can't afford a bicycle, what if they can't afford also a mobile phone? What if they can't afford to put airtime on their mobile phone? What do they do? So that reality, I had to accept it as the community had given it to me. Now, of course, the positive side normally say, because you're dealing with the feelings and perceptions of people, that biasness will come in. But normally, it's also important to report that what the feelings of those people are, whether you believe it or not. Any question before I go further? I think you might. Okay. Let's come to realism. So realism combines the two approaches because most of the time you find it's an argument between two, two completely different ways of looking at research or looking at the phenomena that you are trying to study. One side they are telling you be, be objective, generalize, get as many people ask them and then make a generalization. The other side is saying, no, we need to get an entire view. Eh? So what realism is, is a combination of the two. Sometimes you'll find people reading or, or writing down and say, my, my research followed a mixed method approach. This is what the realism approach is. They are saying that you can have feelings of people and uh, you can interview, let's say, let's say I decide to interview uh, 20 students from every university. Just follow interviews, not questionnaires, interviews to get their feeling on e-learning. So even at the end of that, I can report that out of the, all the private universities that are doing e-learning, of the, each 20 that I sampled, uh, maybe one, 50, no, 50 say they like e-learning. And therefore, I can generalize that e-learning is actually perceived as good. Although I've actually used a, quant a qualitative approach by carrying out interviews and sitting down to discuss with people, I can still use the, the positivist side. Yeah? So it is a way of trying to, to get the best of both worlds, a mixture of positivism and interpretivism. Now we come to the two research approaches, deductive and inductive. Now, we have seen something of a deductive approach in one of the papers that we looked at. Remember the paper I gave you on, um, it was the paper on, on, on what? On multitasking. That is typically a quantitative type of research where they had a theory, they developed a hypothesis, a statement to study, and then designed a research strategy. They used the experimental research to test the hypothesis. Yeah? That is a typical example of, of, of deductive approach. Inductive, this is where you're building theory. You first collect the data to come up with a concept or a theory. 
Now let's understand it in detail. When we think about deductive research, we, we have to think about quantitative research. And when we think about quantitative research, essentially this is the type of research where there is already a lot known about a subject. Yeah, there's quite a bit known about a subject. I'll give you an example. Um, could I ask someone in, your, in, in this class? Eh? Maybe let me ask Tony. Tony, can you quickly Google for us um, theories on ICT adoption? Tony, have you found anything? Uh, Madam, actually, I found innovators. Uh, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and okay, okay, we got cut off there. Um, let me just list some of them for you that I've seen here on Google. The the six theories of theory of the, there are six theories so far that we know of which are looking at adoption. Adoption basically means that. You implement anything ICT related or IT related and to try and predict if this system or application, whatever it is, is going to be used by users. We have, we develop systems as IT professionals, as ICT professionals, and we implement them. It's not a guarantee that they'll be accepted or not. They'll, they'll start using them or not. Yeah. So there are several theories that have been developed. Um, here I'm seeing one of them, which is theory of reasoned action, TRA. Then we have the technology acceptance model term. We have technology organization environment, TOE framework, the theory of planned behavior, T TPB, the unified theory of acceptance and use, UTAUT. Then technology pedagogical content knowledge. That's another theory. There are quite a number of them. Eh? Uh, the others talk about diffusion theory and, and others, eh? and so on and so forth. Now, what does it tell you that a lot of research has gone into ICT adoption? So they've reached a point where you can actually make a prediction on whether technology will be accepted or not. And this theory will have guiding principles. Now, I'll give you an example of TAM, that is the technology acceptance model. There are two principles I'd like to point out that it points out. It says one, people will adopt a technology if they find it useful, and user-friendly, two aspects. If I find a technology useful, I'm going to use it. If I find it user-friendly or usable, I'm going to adopt it. Those are two principles. And then they even went ahead and say, majority men will adopt a technology if they find it useful, and women will normally adopt a technology if they find it easy to use, yeah? Those are two principles. Now, those are principles in theory which you can turn into hypothesis. Yeah. So let us say you you implement you want to implement a, a, an application or a system in a particular context. You can decide to to pull a number of users from that particular context. You do an exper lab experimental research. You ask them to use the system. And then after I'd fill out a questionnaire based on usability and usefulness. And you make a prediction that maybe 20% said they did not find it useful. Um, the other 80% more or less agreed. This percentage said they did not find it uh, usable. This percentage said. So therefore, our hypothesis can then predict 
that this system will be easily adopted. Then you go ahead and implement it and then find out. And you find out the people who found it, have they actually adopted it? Give it time, eh? give it a look, some period of time, maybe a month too. And you try and find out if somebody has used it and you still ask them, do you find it useful? Do you find it uh, usable? Yeah, and those are the hypotheses that you're testing. Yeah, so the more that give the positive, the more the hypothesis is found to be true. If it's not, then you can co you go back and you modify the theory of term. And you say in, the, in our context, we tested this theory and it doesn't work, okay? I don't know if I'm making sense. Pardon, pardon. Pardon? Pardon, hello? Pardon. Uh, did uh, you want me to repeat? Yes, madam. Okay. The whole thing on the duck on 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 hypothesis. Okay. Here we say deduct deducing a hypothesis, a hypothesis from a theory. Yeah. I've given you an example of a theory in the field of adoption. Okay, which is term. Yeah. You can just go and research on each term. Jovia, do you know what we mean? But what we're, what we're saying when we refer to as when we refer to um, adoption, ICT adoption. Um, yes, madam. You understand what it means, eh? Pardon? Maybe. 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 What is what is it that you don't understand? Well, how far do you understand that term? Adoption. Adoption of ICT. It's like acceptance pardon adoption. adoption is acceptance acceptance yeah that you that you're actually using a technology okay yeah. so um an example is all of you are using uh Zivaste, not so yes which means you have adopted it mm -hmm. Uh, all of you are using uh, Moodle, not so? Yes, madam. And which means you have adopted it. All of you are using Zoom. Now, I'll even go further. All of you, most of you are using smartphones, yeah? Yes. Most of you are using computers. You may have a laptop or something. You've, all those are technologies you have adopted. Most of you are using WhatsApp. So those are technologies that you have adopted, yeah? Now, in the field of adoption, yeah? In the field of adoption of ICT, there have been a number of theories that have been developed, meaning that that area is an area which has been well-researched. There's quite a lot that has been known. I asked someone to just Google and see if he can find the anything on theories of adoption, and there are quite a number of them. So I picked out one of them, TAM, yeah? Technology Acceptance Model. So this is a, a theory that helps us predict whether technology is going to be adopted or not, okay? So let us say one of you wants to do research using the positivist and deductive approach on adoption. Okay, maybe you want to study anything. Let us say you want to study e-learning specifically Moodle, okay? So you'd get the theory of term, yeah? You get the theory of term and study the principles it puts forward. A theory is something that helps us predict the way something will behave, any theory. Um, we have talked about before, the theory of 
uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. We've talked about it in this class. And that theory says that every so number of years, species will adopt the environment. So they evolve, yeah? So, and, and, uh, and indeed someone can decide to do a study, uh, maybe a longitudinal study to find out the way um, our, our body structures, eh? maybe they will say, we want to, to examine people who live in the Ruenzori region. They were Toro, they were Konjo, they were so on and so forth. And we find out if maybe a hundred years ago, they do find out research a hundred years ago, are we of the same, let us say, our, as, have any of our phys physical features changed? Maybe our height, our size, um, education levels, all those are though those are variables we are trying to determine. Eh? So we would be trying to say uh, people who lived in Uganda, in let's say in the Renzo religion region a hundred years ago, and those who are living now, uh, we want to measure their height. Those are the variables, specific variables, their height, their weight, um, their um, age, how how what is their lifespan. All those are variables we're trying to say. Maybe somebody puts forward a hypothesis that the longer people stay in a certain environment, the more their bodies evolve and they to adopt that environment, which means they, they, they with time they will grow bigger, they will grow stronger, they will um, they will have longer lives. Like maybe people who lived a hundred years in the Venezuela region were dying younger than before. So that that there you're testing the theory of evolution. Yeah. So you pick out variables like height, weight, uh, edge span, and things like that. Eh? And maybe the, 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 the research will show that people are growing taller, they are growing more healthy, they are living longer. Yeah, so which means they're adopting to their environment much better than their species, the species when it was 200 years ago, okay? So far, are we together? Yes, madam. Okay. Now, in, 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 the, in what you're going to measure, the variables you're going to measure, you state them in a statement, an operational term, eh, which proposes relationship between people, between two, diff, two, two or more variables. So in what I was stating, I was talking about a relationship between um, lifespan, height, and weight, and the environment, yeah? The environment 100 years ago and the environment now. Yeah, the environment and height and weight and lifespan, yeah? So that is what, that statement is a hypothesis. It is basing itself on uh, Darwin's theory, which says that 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 the, the species are going to evolve, which means, which means they are going to adopt to the environment. So what we're basically saying that the longer a species stays in an environment, the longer the body adopts itself, it evolves. So there, there tends to be a positive relationship between an environment and time. Yeah, it causes that that time period causes a positive growth in certain with certain variables. So the person who is carrying out that research, hoping they actually have data of people in Renzori region, maybe 100 or 200 years ago, they would test that hypothesis. They would go and get data from maybe 200 years ago, people living in the, the Renzori region, what was their average height, average weight, and average lifespan. And then people today living in this same region, what is their average height, average weight? And if it shows that there is a positive growth, meaning the people grow taller, people uh, have a healthier body mass index, and people are living longer, it means Darwin's theory is true. We have evolved over time. Okay? So far, are we together? Yes, madam. Yes, yeah. yes madam. Now, we can also bring this into the theory of term. Eh? Now, remember I said term is also a theory which is specifically focused on adoption. Now, term as a theory proposes certain things. Term says that a system would be adopted if it is perceived to be useful 
And then the theory will be adopted if it is perceived to be usable. So let us imagine you carry out an experimental design, laboratory experimental laboratory research. You get your system, put them in a certain lab and ask them to use the system, then give, get their perception. Is it useful? Majority say yes. Is it usable? Majority say yes. Then you say, okay, let me put it now in a working context. And then I ask people after maybe a period of two or three months, maybe even six months, yeah, six months, I ask the same group of people. And you may find that the situation has changed. What in the lab where they said it was useful, now they have said no, yeah? So what does that mean? It has disproved the high working hypothesis, the operational hypothesis, yeah? It has disproved. If we find, however, it, people still perceive it to be useful, then we can say the hypothesis is true. If there's a positive relationship, then we can say it, it, we have approved, we have confirmed the hypothesis, yeah? So far, are we together? Yes. Yeah. So I hope so far we've understood what deduct, the, the deductive approach is. Yes, madam. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, we, could, we could go into this, this example that is here, but I don't want us to waste time because I've already given you enough examples. Eh? Let's look at inductive research. Yes? So the inductive research is the very opposite. We want to understand why, why something is happening. Whereas in deductive research, we want to prove, in inductive research, we want to understand why something is happening. Yeah, meaning we don't have an answer. We want to understand why something is happening. We need to make sense of the data. Whereas in deductive research, the data basically says yes or no. Here we are trying to make sense of something. Okay. So I gave you the example last week of, um, uh, of female genital mutilation. When a researcher goes into such a field, they don't want to know how many people have been uh, circumcised or not. They want to understand why. So they can understand how to stop it. Yeah? Why is it people are continuously doing this thing? So you collect a lot of data and you try to make sense of it. The big difference with inductive research is that here you're beginning to build knowledge, which knowledge is going to help you formulate theory or concepts, yes? Formulate theory, which meaning by the time we do inductive research, we know little or next to nothing about something. So we want to answer the why question. Why, how, what, yeah? We're as opposed to the inductive where we have a hypothesis, a statement which we either prove or disprove or modify. Yeah, where we try to see relationship between one thing and another. Here in inductive research, we are trying to understand what is going on, what variables exist in a context and how do they affect one another? Yes? So far do we understand, do we see the difference between the, these two inductive and deductive? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here I will leave this page. I think you can go through it yourselves. And um, some major differences between the two approaches. But I want to understand, I want you to understand which approach would you select. Number one, it would depend on what is known about a research, the wealth of literature. Like we said, with induct deductive research, normally we know a lot about something. A lot of research has been done and theories have been developed. Yeah. So if theories have been developed, meaning we can maybe try to, to, to ascertain if there are actually relationships in a given context, yeah, in a certain given context. 
so the wealth of information that is there, how much has been studied about a particular area. Two, time. Yeah, deductive approach is very quick, really quick. In the morning, I gave the example of a research that I'm, I've done with Palliative Care Association of Uganda. Um, some of you may know, I, I don't know if you know what palliative care is. Have we heard about palliative care? No, I haven't got an idea. Pardon? No, I haven't, I'm going about it. Okay, okay. So let me explain to you a little bit so you can understand the kind of research I did with, with, with this organization. Now, palliative care, we, in, in healthcare, we have different types of healthcare. We have what the first type is curative. So curative is, let us say you have malaria, you go to a hospital, they give you anti-malarial drugs. You maybe have a bacterial infection, they give you um, antibiotics. That is curative, where you're sick and they try to give you medication to cure your disease. The second is preventive. So preventive is uh, things like um, when you hear people giving talks on using mosquito nets while you sleep so that you prevent uh, contracting malaria. Uh, boil your food, wash, wash uh, your utensils in a clean place and so on and so forth pre to prevent bacterial infection. Um, for those who are HIV, for H prevention and uh, transmission of HIV, uh, use protective sex, be faithful and so on and so forth. Oh, that is preventive health care. Then the last one is palliative. So palliative care is sometimes known as end of life care, normally given to manage pain. So you must, mostly you find people who are um, suffering from cancer, especially in the last stages, life is extremely, extremely painful. So uh, these people need to, for the person to at least live a life of dignity, they will ensure that they treat your pain. Yeah. So it involves those other things, not just pain, they involve other things. There is also counseling, and maybe if you have cancer and you've, you've been told there's nothing more to do, they will help you with things like write your will and things like that. But primarily, when I was involved in the research, uh, what, what has happened in Uganda is that this palliative care association. Uh, carries out certain things like, for example, a trainer healthcare, a healthcare worker in palliative care, so that you find that most health facilities you go to, there is a palliative care nurse who can prescribe to you morphine when you are in extreme pain um, and, and provide any other basic service. And also they ensure that each of those health facilities have morphine. So morphine is what is used, especially for people with HIV, people with cancer, and sometimes also people with uh, sickle cells anemia, because it also can be a quite a, a quite a very painful disease. So in 2021, they needed to find out uh, morphine access in these health facilities. So as a researcher in, involved with PICAL, um, we designed a questionnaire, we put it in a form, in a Google form and sent it to the healthcare workers all over Uganda. So all these people had to do was fill in the content, would fill the respond to the, uh, fill in the questionnaire and send it back. And then I would receive those responses in an Excel file and then analyze them either using Excel or SPSS, any. So um, that is quite quick. You can do that in a month or two. This is very different from qualitative or inductive approach. Now. With qualitative, quantitative research, it's about how many. The more people you, get, you have responses to, the more you can generalize. With inductive or qualitative research, it depends on how deep you go, yeah? So I gave you the example of the research I did in India, where I spent a lot, a lot of, I mean, every single workshop these village health teams had, I was present. Then I had, I would sit with them as they, as they were trained for, uh, on using a mobile phone. I sat with them as we had um, different, just basically different things. Eh? So that really took a lot of time. Eh? Conrad, you have a question? Yes, madam. 
uh, it's not a question, it's just a light up. If uh, I want to, to be enlightened. Yes. So if uh, it's a qualitative research, does it depend on uh, the number of questions you put on the questionnaire? Because you, you said how deep you go. It's how deep you go. So um, let me even, let me give you an example. When, when let's, it, it's how deep you go, it's, it's how far you go to understand a situation. So let me give you an example. I sat down with community members as they carried out their training. I just sat and listened. And I went for about five or six trainings of theirs where I didn't ask any question over a period of a year. Then I had focus group discussions with them where we gave them general questions and they responded. And you could even, you could say, let me pull a, a, a person aside and understand more about this thing. So you may have a number of questions and you may even decide to go off script to the questionnaire and to try and go deeper. Maybe they'll say something which triggers you to ask more and more eh? so you can understand more, yeah? So it isn't the thing with qualitative research, it's not just about getting the surface data, but getting the, the something really in depth, yes? So sometimes qualitative research can take a long time. Like for me, it took me two years to collect that data. Other times, no, uh, it may take a, a, a less, a shorter time, but normally qualitative research takes quite some good time. What some people do is decide to combine the two, quantitative and qualitative, where the person says, I will have an inter interview sessions, but I'll also give out questionnaires so that they combine the two approaches to try and save time. Conrad, have I answered your question? Yes, madam. Yeah, so you can see from my example that deductive approach takes a short time to collect data. So I gave you the example of the Picao case where it took me a few months, a month or two. The only problem was when you saw um, the healthcare worker that is not responding, then you call them up and, oh, could you please respond to my questionnaire? And then inductive, which really takes time where you have to spend a lot of time with people, sit down with them, observe them today, tomorrow, the next day, really trying to understand something. Then there's also the question of risk, yeah? Normally they say deductive approach has less risk, yeah? Because you already have theories which are there to guide you on, on, the, on the expected behavior. And inductive, there is no theory. What, there's just new knowledge emerging. But also I'd like to say also with deductive approach, there is a risk, yes? Uh, I, I, my, I did my research in Uganda, yes, but uh, my supervisor was in the Netherlands. So one time when I went to visit, um, there was a lady I was sharing an office with, and she had sent out her questions via email, to her questionnaire via email. And majority of the people hadn't responded. And what did that mean? You see, we said with deductive approach or especially quant quantitative research, it's the number. If you have a certain a minimum, if, you, if your numbers are below minimum, you can't generalize your response and you can't even report that this is data that we received. You really must receive a minimum number. Yeah, sometimes they say 100, but it can even be more depending on the sample size, the, the people who actually belong to a certain category that you're researching. So it can also be risky, especially when you have people not responding to your questions, your questionnaire. So how do we pick the approach and in relationship to the research strategy. One is uh, what we, we think about uh, why is the approach important? The question, it, go, it all goes back to the phenomena that I'm trying to study. Does it need a, an inductive approach or deductive? Is it possible for me to combine the approaches? Then which strategy can best help me answer that, that question. So everything is interrelated. You simply can't get things and throw them together and hope things will work out. No, it, whatever you pick, you must be able to defend it and defend it well, whatever approach you, you select, okay? So I'll give you an example. For me, I chose an inductive approach. One, because that was an area that had very little research. Two, 
because we are talking about ICT in development, development requires a holistic view. I needed to understand everything that surrounded a mobile phone uh, user, yeah, the entire picture. So I needed to take an inductive approach to sit down with people. I remember at a certain point when uh, we were we were showing the, the, the VHTs how to use their mobile phones to send messages. Then one person said in turn, now this thing is going to take my battery. And you know, battery, we need to charge, it takes money, you have to take to somebody. Now already you can see something like that was indicating that poverty, limited incomes were going to affect these people sending weekly reports on their mobile phones. It was affecting their, their battery lives, it was affecting eyesight, it was affecting so many things, yeah? So but that was because I spent time with them. Any questions so far? Yes, Conrad. Yes, madam. Mm -hmm. uh, with the inductive versus deductive, you have talked about the time scope of uh, inductive. Yes. It takes a long time. Yes. So uh, given our time scope as, as students, can we really use that approach? Uh, deductive, yeah, that, that, that would be, of course, that is now something you have to make a decision on when you're doing your research. Don't pick an area where you know data will take a long time, yeah? And most of the time, what I normally see undergraduates do is try to combine the two, both deductive and inductive, using the realism approach, so that you try to get the best of both worlds. Yeah, so you, you, you do questionnaires and you also use interviews and also observation. So that way you get away with having a combination of the two. And also that, that saves you a lot of time. Have I answered your co question, Conrad? Yes, madam. Okay. Because especially, especially when you're developing systems, you need to understand the situation, how things work. Eh? So for example, you may need to go and observe the, the business processes that are going on somewhere, and that will need a qualitative approach. Um, but then you may also need your questionnaire to get other things that you may not get from the questionnaire. So you can combine the two. Do we have any other question? No question? Okay, okay. So um, what I will do, we shall end here. Then next week we shall look at research strategies and have our first assignment, okay? Yes, madam. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking time uh, to come for the lecture and I wish you a good week. Thank you.